Thank you everybody for joining us for this episode of the Book Brush Podcast. Today I'm joined by Adam Ross Nelson, who is a data scientist who helps people coaching their careers getting into data science and has written several books on the topic, has tons of coaching material, and is here to share with us his journey of building this career and building this presence online. So Adam, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very glad to be here. So can you tell us a little bit about your journey into the data science career um, and how you became both interested in data science and in your sort of coaching career that's kind of blossomed out of that? Sure. You know, one in one way or another over my entire career since the late 90s, uh, I've been in education, believe it or not. My first full-time job ever, ever was as a teacher of English as a foreign language in Budapest, Hungary, of all places. Wow. And yeah, that was in the late 90s. And for those of you who are also in the middle or the later portion of your career, you might remember it was pretty popular for Americans. Uh, there's some privilege for you, though, to keep in mind. But it was pretty popular for Americans to go abroad in the 90s to teach English just about anywhere in the world. And I did that. So I taught English in, in Hungary in the late 90s. And ever since then, I had stayed in education, pretty much either teaching or administration, mm -hmm. mostly higher education ever since that point. And then eventually, in my mid-30s, I was working on a PhD, a PhD in educational leadership and policy analysis. And during that PhD program, I got really good at statistics. I teched up and realized that a career in data science would be a good move for me, a good, a good transition for me. So I became a data scientist in my very late 30s. And it's interesting because my friends and family, some of whom were in tech, some of whom weren't necessarily, and also definitely my coworkers at the time in my mid 30s, they knew what was da what data science was, but I'm not 100% sure I knew what data science was. And they started calling me a data scientist for the work that I was doing. And I said, no, of course not. I'm not a data scientist. I'm just a researcher. I just, I'm just getting my PhD here and I'm just being a researcher. Yeah. And then I realized they were right. So maybe you've had similar experiences too, where someone tells you, makes an observation about yourself. It's like the Johari window, the things mm -hmm. you know, but nobody else knows, the things that other people know that you don't know, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And so I gave in and I said, sure, okay, I'm a data scientist. And eventually also there was an opening at, a, at, a, at an organization who needed not only a data scientist, but a data scientist who was an expert in the very kinds of data that I was studying and that I was very good at working with. And so they hired me as a data scientist and the rest was history on my career. But then how did I get into the data science career coaching? That's a different story. Also, not necessarily very intentional. I started writing articles online about my work and about data science in general and about my transition. And folks would reach out to me and ask for advice on how they could take their career into data science. And I was helping out as much as I could pro bono here and there. I could help some people, but not always and not everyone. So I just did my best, but then eventually I realized I can combine the teaching, the education and the data science and my own experiences mm -hmm. into a coaching practice. Yeah, And that's when I decided. It sounds like it's really full circle coming from this educational background, developing your career in data science, and then coaching people not only in data science, but also in how to transition their career, maybe if it's a second or later career transition for people. It's super, super interesting. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So for those who don't know, since we're referring to it, what exactly is data science? And like, why would, how did you kind of differentiate that from research in your mind as you articulated it for yourself in the past to really what data science is today? Well, the, the short answer for what data science is, at least recently, is that data scientists are the folks behind generative artificial intelligence. Okay. So you might be familiar with with uh, ChatGPT, sure. Bard, Gemini, Microsoft Copilot. And I can promise you that, yes, data scientists are the ones behind those tools. But I can also promise you that data scientists are really good at a lot of other things as well. 
So for example, we're the ones that are responsible for the recommendations that you get when you're browsing Netflix. So we're really good at taking a look at you as a Netflix user or a YouTube user, knowing what videos and what shows you've been interested in the past, mm -hmm. analyzing that, and also comparing you with other folks who are using the platform, and then predicting, predicting, that's what we do, predicting what video you'll be interested in seeing next or what television show you'll be interested in watching next. And maybe you've had an experience like this where you're on a platform and all of a the sudden there's this YouTube video that you just needed to have mm -hmm. in your life. Like you needed that video, but you didn't know right. it existed. Mm -hmm. And so it was the data scientists who brought you that, who mm -hmm. brought you that video. Another favorite area that I like to talk about when it comes to data science is medicine. Mm. So, for example, data scientists have used a subfield uh, in data science known as computer vision. And they can take a photo of a mole that you might have on your skin or a patient might have on their skin. And then just looking at the photo of the mole, the mm. computer algorithms, the tools that data scientists are able to build can diagnose. And I'll do air quotes around diagnose, because if there's any physicians, they'll tell you that only a physician can do a diagnosis. But right. the data science tool can identify if that mole is cancerous or not. Mm -hmm. The data science tool is more accurate than physicians looking at the same photo. Yeah, that's amazing. It's powerful. It's extremely mm -hmm. powerful. So now we're looking at, in that case, we would say to give the very... Uh, all of the respect that physicians uh, have earned, we have to say that we have data science uh, assisting physicians in making the diagnoses. Yeah. And we also use data science and medicine to discover new drugs, new chemicals. Mm -hmm. And that is another very powerful aspect of data science. And there's one more I'll mention. Folks may have encountered this at their workplace or maybe in passing in the news. Data scientists have another subfield called natural language processing, and that lets us look at documents, unstructured documents, words, phrases. Sometimes it's 100 words long, sometimes it's 10,000 words long. And we can use a variety of techniques to summarize those information. We can extract topics from that information. We can, we can identify and measure the sentiment of that information. And we can use we can use computers to do what would take an army of humans to do. So, for example, if you have a thousand, ten thousand, a hundred thousand documents to look at, it would take humans ages to get mm -hmm. through all of that information and summarize it. And you'd also worry about consistency from one human to the next. Mm. But with the computer, we can cycle through those very quickly, very consistently, and very accurately and produce meaningful insights from that information. Yeah, that's very interesting. So you kind of covered like a bunch of different areas where we're seeing data science really playing a big role through, you know, AI, language LLMs, la large language models, and natural language processing. Um, what we like to refer to, of course, is the algorithm and how it rules our lives on YouTube and Netflix and everything like you said. Where what types of problems, and I think you kind of address this, you know, it's being able to run through vast quantities of information rapidly and with a high level of specificity and accuracy. And I think if I may differentiate here, and this kind of goes back to the physician model that you were giving, you know, there's a level of contextual knowledge that physicians bring to bear when looking at a photo, and there's a level of specificity that computers are really, really good at doing when they look at a photo. Uh, is that an accurate representation of human intelligence working in conjunction with artificial intelligence? I need to hire you because you just explained that better than I could. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you so right. much. So yeah. to hear, if I heard you correctly, and I really like the way you put this, the, the contextual information, which comes from education, comes from study, comes from training, comes from on-job experience that physicians have, it's hard to give that to a computer. And it's yeah. all extremely valuable. But then there's this really, I can't remember the word you used, but the specificity associated with the individual image of the mole. Yeah, A computer can look at that image in ways that humans cannot, that the physician cannot. 
Right. And with the the very systematic, very rigorous analysis of that mm. image, the computers can produce a meaningful insight. And in this yeah. case, we're looking again at cancer diagnosis, which is often as good as or better than the physician's mm. uh, view, visual inspection of the mole. Now, let's be clear, a physician who has the ability to biopsy the mole and, and right. take take additional samples and do it to other tests, the physician is going to outperform the computer in that in that scenario. But when we're looking at the computer's ability to look at the photo and the physician's ability to look at the photo, the computer yeah. often outperforms the physician. And the ability to look at 10,000 photos in a minute. Um, so that the rapidity is as well. Yeah, mm -hmm. so interesting, the volume that we can do. So who are some famous data scientists that uh, people should know about that maybe have impacted our lives and we don't even know? I'm so glad you asked this question. I love this question. So I, a lot of folks expect me to point to someone back in the 80s or the 90s or maybe the 70s or maybe even, let's say, the 40s, 50s, 60s. I want to go all the way back to the mid-1800s to a woman named Ada Lovelace. And I say she was the first data scientist. She lived from, the eight, from 1815 to 1852, so a very long time ago. This was, a, this was a time in human history where electricity was not yet widely available. And she's often credited, for any history buffs and science history buffs that might be listening, she's often credited with being the very first data scientist, I'm sorry, the very first computer scientist because she's very famous for having written out what many regard as the first written computer algorithm or written mm. uh, software code in, in essence as well. Yeah. Now, I've taken a look at her journals, and you can see passages from her journals published in a variety of areas. And I'll read a passage for you. I have a passage right here. I'm going to read it for you. So she writes, the analytical engine might act upon objects found whose mutual fundamental relations could be expressed by those of the abstract science of operations. Okay, so that doesn't make sense a whole lot right now, but the next phrase really is pivotal. Supposing, for instance, the fundamental relations of pitched sounds in the science of harmony and of musical competition were susceptible of such expression and adaptations, the engine might compose elaborate and scientific pieces of music of any degree of complexity or extent. Now, wow. when you read hear that, what do you mm -hmm. think she's talking about? It sounds like she's talking about using computers to understand different pitches and tones and using those to recombine into, you know, new new combinations, what we would call songs. That's absolutely right. And it's generative artificial intelligence. So right. generative artificial intelligence fairly recently became widely available. Mm -hmm. We've had versions of generative artificial intelligence for a long time, but with uh, the basically the release of OpenAI's ChatGPT, there, there's been an explosion. So here's Ada Lovelace in the 1800s writing about generative artificial intelligence. If you are looking to learn about data science and you haven't specifically looked at Ada Lovelace, you need to do yourself a favor and go do that. Um, I have another data scientist who I'm a extremely large fan of, and her name is Kathy O'Neill, and she wrote Weapons of Math Destruction. That's, That's math. a great title. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? <laughs> Weapons of Math Destruction. And again, she's a favorite website of, or she's a favorite data scientist of mine to get just a little bit of a hint of her personality and her persona, her website. She runs a small website called mathbabe.org. Mm -hmm. And her book is full of information about data science. And for folks looking to become data scientists, I often recommend her book because she spends a fair bit of time in her book talking about her own transition into data science as well. And in her book, she defines what a weapon of math destruction is, and it's specifically the ability to scale harms. Hmm. And we can talk maybe more about that later, but really one of the things that data science can do is you indicated the ability of a computer to look at 100 photos in a minute or 1,000 photos in a minute for really good benefits. We can mm -hmm. pretty well di accurately diagnose cancer. But we can also, if we're not careful, we can also scale the harms associated with data science as well. Mm -hmm. So that's well, the premise for her book. I'd actually really love to dive in 
to that topic with you because I know that as much hope as artificial intelligence is inspiring for people, a, a whole new, you know, creativity and people working with it and getting inspired, um, lay people, you know, working on make, making their own apps and things like that because of the ability to interact with tools like this. At the same time, we have many, many people talking about putting guardrails on it. What are some of those guardrails that we should be aware of when we talk about exponentially expanding some of those harms that are intrinsic in our biases and in our culture and things like that? Sorry, I'm like jumping you. Uh, I'm, no, okay. I'm throwing a question at you. Yeah, I don't know. Did we I keep the DEI question in here, or did we skip that? We did. We've got okay. it. Um, the what role do ethical considerations play in working with data scientists, and how you address yeah. ethical? Yeah, maybe yeah. actually, um, could we do before? I, I like the transition, but could we do a yeah. wrap up on the uh, yes, and edit the, it back together? The famous data scientists. Yes. Like maybe just asks me. Um, they something like, oh yeah, those two people sound great anymore. And I'll just give okay, you, sure. I'm just going to give drop three names. Okay. So beyond those two examples, do you have any others that you think people should take a closer look at? I'm so glad you asked. Yes, there's three more and we don't have time to go into them today. You can Google for them. They are contemporaries. I recommend folks look into Sebastian Rashka, also John Crone and Stephanie Molin. Perfect. So I did want to dive in a little bit on this sort of question of the ethics around AI. You mentioned earlier the, the math destruction and expanding exponentially the harms that exist in our society that are already here being leveraged within these AI tools. And as much as there's hope about these things, we do hear a lot of people saying, hey, we really need to put guardrails around that. So what are some of the ethical concerns with artificial intelligence and some of the guardrails that you think are necessary? Well, on this topic, the first thing we know for sure is that the issues of ethics, fairness, equity, access, transparency, are not as fully well explored in the field as they should be or need to be. Um, they're not, they're, they're just, they're underdeveloped. The field is mm -hmm. underdeveloped in this way. Mm -hmm. And one of the pieces of evidence that I have for this is if you were to do an experiment like I've done several times, go to the library or go to the bookstore, find a stack of books on data science, and then search the, the appendices, search the glossaries, search the table of contents only about 20% of the books cover ethics in a meaningful way, mm -hmm. in a very deep, meaningful way. And when I was writing my books, that was one of the problems. The publisher asked me, what's a problem you'd like to solve with this book? And I said, that's a problem I can solve with this book, is I can bring a book, uh, the Confident Data Science book especially, uh, goes into depth on ethics, culture, and history of the field. Mm -hmm. So we need to do more. We need to do more as data scientists. And, and that's also one of the problems I feel I can solve as a, as a career coach, helping folks transition their career into data science. I can help candidates prepare themselves with two things. One, pre a good interviewer, a good some of the best employers are going to ask questions about ethics, integrity, fairness, and transparency in the interview process. So I can make sure my candidates that I work with are prepared to answer those questions well. Mm -hmm. But not only that, they're prepared to do well once they are on the job. In other words, they can bring a level of sophistication, a level of literacy on the topic of, of equity and fairness. One of my favorite pieces of advice to give data scientists or to give consultants, because I spent some of my career in consulting as well, one of my favorite pieces of advice when it comes to an analytical project is this. The beginning of any analytical project, you always have to ask the principal, the key stakeholder, the person who's requesting the analysis. You have to ask, what will we do if, this is an important question, what will we do if this result or this analysis produces a result that is unexpected or even unflattering? and unfavorable to our work or our position. Mm. And I guarantee you over the course, especially over the course of an entire career, it's not if this will happen, it's a matter yeah. of when it will happen, right? So the process of going through that conversation, having a conversation with folks and having the conversation, but then also documenting the results of that conversation. If we get an unfavorable, unflattering result, we're gonna do this, this, and this. 
And then now all of a sudden, when that happens, it's the conversation is less about, oh, no, what do we do now? Mm -hmm. And the conversation is more along the lines, oh, we anticipated this. Yes, this result doesn't make us look so good. We're not very happy with this result, but we have a plan in place in order to cope with this and manage this. Mm -hmm. And we could also talk about the best plans. I think in short, the best plans are disseminate those results, even though they are unfavorable, but disseminate them with context and also disseminate them with initial plans that are designed to undo any harms that you're potentially causing or to redress any any faults that you may have discovered about yourself or about your organization, about your process, et cetera. Right. Just let, let sunshine be the disinfectant. Share the information, get input from others, and then apply that input in order to, like as I said, redress the issues. Yeah, I think that's really well said. We all know in the era of social media and the internet, these things don't stay hidden for long. And to get no. out ahead of that story and to um, contextualize it with your best efforts yeah. is always going to be m yes. far well, far far better received by the public yeah. than than I, anything else. You reminded me of a turn of phrase I heard on the radio yesterday. We've never it's n it's never been harder to keep a secret, mm -hmm. and it's never been easier to make a mistake. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think with, that's with, fantastic. Yeah. And, it, you know, it, it really goes to the heart. And, you know, obviously here at Book Brush, we interact with social media quite a bit and we interact with the marketing for um, authors and aspiring writers and that sort of thing. And always there's controversy going on in the in the universe, even in the reader space, in the art, in the writer space, all of those things. And I think more than ever, people are want that authenticity. They want to be able to feel like in a world where we interact with screens that I'm I'm still feeling like I'm connecting to a real person. I think so. I think so. And the the I, now now you've given me another maybe turn of phrase. I'm going to have to workshop this one a little bit. But the compassionate data scientist or the empathetic mm. data scientist, that's what the world needs more of. Yeah, I think that's well said. So, OK, so transitioning back here, this was such a great conversation. Um, as people are going through this journey of potentially transitioning into a di data science career, first of all, what makes it an attractive choice? Why should people consider it? And then what are some of the things that they should be aware of and as as they look to do that? Sure. To be to be direct and straightforward, one of the key things that draws people, I think, to data science is is how lucrative the career can be. The you can you can earn a lot of money and pro do a really good job of providing for your family and also helping out friends and helping out the community. One of the other biggest draws, and this is so strong, one of the other biggest draws for data science is that it's an intellectually engaging career choice. You cannot be a data scientist without constantly learning, constantly discovering new things. That's well, that's the nature of the work is to discover new knowledge or to build and create new knowledge with your analysis. And that's incredibly appealing for many, many folks, especially folks who have mid and late career professionals who I work with the most, especially mid and late career professionals who have already amassed a decades long career or maybe even more information from that career, hands on, practicable, in the office, on the factory floor or out in the field knowledge. And now it's time to use that knowledge. We call it domain knowledge in data science. Use that knowledge about the field in combination with data science in order mm. to in order to build something that's greater than the sum of the individual components or the the outright components. So two big reasons why folks, I think, are drawn into data science. Another reason is, and this one I roll my eyes at, Harvard, I think it was Harvard, got famous with a headline calling, and this was a while ago now, but they called data science the sexiest career choice in America or something like that or the world. And every data scientist I know is not choosing data science because of it's, it's a sexy career. That's mm -hmm. not why, that's not what motivates data scientists. I'm sorry, Harvard just got it wrong. I think well, now I'll probably kick myself. I'll check my notes later and it wasn't Harvard. It was some other big organization, media organization that uh, said the sexiest career in the world. Or, but anyway, the, the reason data scientists go into this field is because we care about our work. 
We want to make a difference. We want to be intellectually challenged. We want to learn. We want to grow. And we want to use our skills to help other people. Mm -hmm. So Harvard, if that's sexy to you, great. But <laughs> remember that I think... Um, I think data scientists are quite a quite a bit less vain than that headline mm. yeah. would imply, and that's really important for data. I'm I'm sort of on a mission to rehabilitate the vis the 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 view of data scientists in the wake of that particular headline, and sometimes sometimes that thinking. So, what was the other question you asked a little bit about the challenges of transitioning into the field? Yeah. Um, so, what are some of the things that you see people if they're coming from a different career, you know? Um, let's just take one that might be a common transition, which is maybe you're coming from more of like a web programming background. And, okay. you know, we've seen a round of layoffs. So you have programmatic fundamentals. You're probably familiar with programming languages. And now you're coming into, you know, more of a data science view because the market has changed. What are some of the things that as an example that sure. that person might say, okay, here are some holes I need to shore up. Here are some differences. Mm -hmm. here, what should I be looking out for? Yeah, there's a phrase that I tell everyone who will listen, uh, especially mid and late career professionals though, what got you here is not what's going to get you there. Yeah, And that's really important. And many mid and late career professionals are already very successful. Uh, that maybe they had some early success in getting early career traction, and then they've been working in in an area for 5, 10, 15 years, maybe 20 years. And now it's time to for to to make a transition, a career transition. And in for the folks I work with, they're specifically aiming for data science. So what again, what got you here isn't necessarily what's going to get you there. And one of the biggest changes that has happened in the field, and this affects all professions, mm -hmm. is the job boards went from newspapers to online. Yeah. And this happened quite a while ago. But it's but it it's I don't know if you know if newspapers have job sections anymore. I think the New York Times still does. <laughs> With those job boards, now employers are seeing more and more applicants, much more, many more applicants than they, they had been seeing in earlier generations or earlier iterations of sort of the job search process, the recruiting process, and then also the job search process. Well, as a result of receiving so many more applications, employers need a way to get through those applications more quickly. Well, now they're using data science to do that. And, and for a long time, the the software that employers were using to get through those applications very quickly, at least on an initial look, was using tools that weren't quite data science. They might have been like data, you might call them data, data science light or diet data science. But what, what this means for mid and late career professionals who started their career, especially 15, 20 years ago, the resumes they were writing 15, 20 years ago were largely written for people to read first. And now we need to write resumes for computers to read first. Yeah. So the computer is going to look at the resume before a human will look at the resume. And what gets really difficult, and this is the thing I spend some of the, 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 the most intense moments with clients when we're doing resume writing, what, what really gets difficult is writing the resume for both mm. and also knowing the sequence that first the computer is going to look at it and then a person's going to look at it. Because if we were going to write it just for the computer, we would do one thing. If we're going to write it just for the person, we'd do another thing. And But writing for both, it means, has other implications for how you build your sentences, how you build your punctuation, how you structure mm. the resume. And that is that is so important. The other thing I'd like to point, remind folks is, and we have really good data on this. So I did some analysis of data available from the National Center for Education Statistics. Uh, one of the surveys that National Center for Education Statistics, which is a part of the US Department of Education did was they asked college graduates, uh, are you employed? And then for those that were employed, how did you get your job? And some of the options were I applied with through a job board or friends and family helped me out or faculty helped me out or had an internship. There are a variety of other other options there. And so I equated friends and family and then also um, colleagues. Uh, or I think the selection was family and then the other selection was colleagues and, and mentors. So I created the, equated those to networking. 
because that's what networking is, right? The oh, NCS absolutely. survey didn't ask networking, but that's what it is. It's a euphemism. Uh, which which strategy do you think is the most important or which one do you mo think most often leads to a job if you were to take a stab at it? Well, as someone who has always gotten my jobs this way and as someone who's done recruiting quite a bit in the past, okay. networking a thousand okay. times is my guess. You are, believe it or not, in the minority. Really? Believe it or not, in the minority. The The biggest category is applying to jobs, job wow. boards. Yeah. yeah. So, and that just tells us a lot about how, that actually tells us a lot about selection bias mm. because a lot of the career advice, a lot of, and some of the best career advice out there is network, network, network. Here's how you network. Here's how you can get better at networking. Yeah. But when you really di dive into the data and you really look at the data, you quickly realize that there's this whole other job search strategy, the traditional resume and cover letter that also matters, that also matters. Yeah. So I work really hard with clients on that because it's data driven, but I also I also work hard, hard with clients on how to network. And that is the, the the next thing I should probably mention here is for data scientists, mm -hmm. you have to show that you can do the work. Yeah. It's very difficult when you're transitioning careers because mm -hmm. you don't you don't have a previous employer to point back to and say I did this work at the previous employer. Right. So in lieu of that, in substitute of that, what you need instead are projects, portfolio projects mm -hmm. that put a model, a data science predictive model into production. Mm -hmm. So I also work with clients uh, hand in hand. We work hand in hand on this to make sure that they have projects they can share with recruiters, potential hiring managers, uh, coworkers, and others in that, in that job search process. So they can show the skills and abilities and the proficiencies they have in data science. Fantastic. So given our conversation around the ethics of AI and then also now how much AI and data science is involved with the review and culling of applicants, there has been a lot of conversation around sort of biases kind of being reflected and built into that screening process. So if there are certain demographics that are typically hired, then maybe the data says, oh, this is the sort of person who should be hired. And it makes yeah. that jump from correlation to causation that we all do. But and then and then in, so could, do you mind speaking a little bit to that ethical question specifically since right. this came up as an example? Yeah, that this makes for a great example of what we were talking about earlier. And two things come to mind. The 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 book, Weapons of Math Destruction, Kathy lays out because Kathy and I are obviously on a first name basis. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I actually do look forward to meeting her in person for the first time at a conference coming up later later this month. But uh, Kathy O'Neill in her book writes a very clear four pointed definition of what constitutes a math a weapon of math destruction. And if you were to apply that definition to these automated applicant tracking system programs, absolutely, they fit the definition of weapon of math destruction, Abs absolutely, at least potentially. One of the best examples of the, the quirk, the phenomena, or the harm, if you just want to be direct about it, that you're giving is a, and I don't know if, I don't remember if this was Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft, it was one of the big companies, one of the big tech companies was using an automated applicant tracking system that was scoring resumes. And they found that it was automatically or virtually, it seemed to be automatically downscoring applications from women. Mm. And <laughs> I know, right? Yeah. So we're basically, what we're doing is we're basically scaling and replicating the gender-based biases mm. that we know exist in society. So that's the weapon of math destruction. One of the reasons, this part's the fascinating part, one of the reasons the automated applicant tracking system was automatically downscoring women as a group is because some of the women had attended women-only colleges. Oh. So the, the women-only colleges showed up on the resume and the predictive algorithm learned to mm -hmm. downscore resumes that referenced the names of those schools. Mm. Wow. So we, yeah, yeah, absolutely. It, it really is a wow moment. And, and mm -hmm. ostensibly, the organization that was doing this 
Well, they actually probably followed my advice, whether directly or indirectly. They did an analysis. They found an unflattering result. They disseminated those results, shared what the context was, shared what they were going to do to fix it, and then also gathered feedback in order to further reduce mm. harms, further reduce bias, et cetera. Yeah. I have another impromptu question for you. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm really curious about this dynamic that seems to be manifesting in this post-AI, post-data uh, data analytics kind of world where computers are talking primarily to computers. I've noticed it in the marketing space as well, where you can obviously use ChatGPT and other generative AI programs to create text, to create blog posts. Um, you can use uh, AI to help you with your SEO and improve the ranking of your website. And at the same time, Google is using AI to search for, make sure that the articles it's proposing are not made with AI. You know, and so there's this like arms race going on in marketing to a certain extent, or even with the the applicants. You know, it's like you're. I know that a lot of applicants are using AI to write their resume, but then AI is reading the resume. And so what do you think about this world where ultimately computers are generating content for other computers to consume and parse out? I think this is a phase. I hope mm -hmm. this is a phase that, because humans are configuring the systems, right? Yeah. And humans are the ones that are creating this feedback loop and building the systems. I sincerely hope and believe that we will rise above that and we mm -hmm. will find more sophisticated uses for machine learning, artificial intelligence, generative AI. Uh, but also, it's a necessary phase now that I think about it. I don't know if I've had a chance to think in this way about this specific question, especially on the fly, but it might be a necessary phase too because mm -hmm. we are still learning about this this. Thing that we're, we've created and this thing we're in the process of creating. And yes. by thing, I'm using the word thing as a, as a sort of a collective catch-all for generative AI, data science, machine learning, uh, artificial intelligence. And yeah, one of the ways we can learn about how yeah. it works, how the thing we built works is by having it interact with itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, could, I think... It kind of reminds me, and this is a, perhaps a bit of a stretch in terms of an allegory, is like when we first kind of realize, going back to the wheel in human society, and you're making a wagon, like to have roads that work for everyone, you have to say that the distance between your wheels is going to be the same. And that mm -hmm. distance then translated through human, like we sort of collectively agreed that this is how wheels are going to work, but like who decided, right? And I think that this interaction of computers talking to computers, and you can find really funny examples of, I, and this kind of speaking to what I think people are calling the dead internet nowadays, where you'll see an unhinged, like clearly AI image post to, posted to Facebook and a bunch of bots like commenting on that image. And you're just like, no human is involved here. This is like wackadoodle stuff to kind of witness. Mm -hmm. But it, I think it's like one of those moments where we're having this transitional phase of deciding, well, what's going to be the distance between the wheels? What, what are we right. going to decide is going to be standard for us to mm -hmm. operate with this new tool in our technology? Yeah. And where we're going with this is, ideally, where we're going with this is we'll have a scenario where AI can do the dishes for us, do our laundry, and take out our garbage, while we sit back and make paintings, write yeah. poetry. And because I, I don't want to be doing the dishes while the AI is writing a poem. Mm -hmm. I want that to be completely reversed. And yeah. if, if we do things right as a collective, as a humanity, as a human collective, we will get there. We're not there now. We're certainly not there now. We may be not even close by most, by most ways of thinking, but hopefully we'll get there. Is AI a threat or a boon to the data science career, in your opinion? So is AI a threat or a boon to the field of data science? Is that yeah. what you're thinking? Yeah. yeah. I think it's it's both. It's mm -hmm. both. Uh, right now, one of the more popular questions is, will artif generative artificial intelligence replace me in my work? And I think the answer to that is generally no. Mm -hmm. Instead, a smart person who knows how to use generative AI well is going to replace you in your work mm -hmm. if yeah. you don't become the smart person who knows how to use generative AI well. Yeah. 
And one of my favorite analogies is generative AI is, especially in education, the question now is, should we allow generative AI in the classroom? Well, that ship has sailed, fellow teachers and educators. Generative AI is in your classroom, whether you wanted it there or not. Right. Uh, we used to ask this question in the 80s. I'm old enough to remember math class in the 80s. Should we allow calculators in the classroom? Yeah. Well, now you can't have math class without a calculator. Calculators mm -hmm. are in the official curriculum for all math classes at pretty much all ages. Yeah. So generative AI is going to go the way that the calculator went, in my opinion. Yeah, I agree. I, I'm very interested in how AI is Im impacting education myself. And I saw one teacher outline how they address it as an English teacher teaching writing and essays and that sort of thing. And the way that they approached it is they had much more ideation phase at the beginning. So writing yes. outlines and understanding the questions that you're answering in your essay and providing you the analysis um, that you want to go for. And those items, like for example, the outline was weighted much heavier than the essay, the final result. And they actually told the student, now go use this essay and use ChatGPT to write an essay with it, interact with ChatGPT, figure out how to make it work for you to produce a good result with your original ideas. And that was how they were actually embracing and interacting with ChatGPT in the classroom, understanding that this is the next Google, this is the next Wikipedia, this is the next calculator, as you rightly say. It's a tool that we know, if we know how to leverage it properly, is, is going to be a part of our lives. This is clever because this teacher acquaintance of yours is the smart person who figured out a good way to use generative AI. And once again, it's not generative AI in and of itself that's going to replace us. It's smart people who use generative AI well, who have yeah. the potential to influence our, or replace us, influence our work or, or outright replace us. Yeah, thank you. That's really well said. So you've written two books on data science You'll have to give us the titles as well. And of course, countless blog articles, and you've contributed on various podcasts, including this one right now, as we're talking. What is your writing process? What? Are, how do you um, kind of internalize these things that you're learning on the job and through your coaching and then develop that into written content? Uh, thank you for the question. Yeah, I have two books. The This one is How to Become a Data Scientist, a Guide for Established Professionals. And then this one is... Uh, confident data science, discover the essential skills of data science. And the in terms of process, this blue book is self-published. And this book, this, this green book is published with a publisher named Kogan Page. So I have experience working through the self-publishing process and through the publisher pub, publishing house publishing process. And I don't know, a lot of times people ask me, do you have a preference for one or the other? And I like them both. They both have their pros and they both have their cons. I'm exceedingly thankful and grateful that that Kogan Page included me in their, actually they have a series of confident books, confident fill in the blank for the profession. So I wrote Confident Data Science. And then I'm also consider myself extremely fortunate and thankful to have been able to do the self-publishing route. I had a lot of help for that one, by the way. I didn't do everything on my own. In fact, this beautiful cover, I don't know if I could have designed this beautiful cover myself, but I had, like I said, I had some, I had some help on that. For others who are aspiring to write a book in data science or really any field, and I hope this might be an opportunity to speak to some aspiring authors as well, one of the best things I did for my writing was attend a book writing retreat. Mm. So my first book writing retreat for, well, I've had writing retreats for before in, in my academic work when I was doing PhD stuff. But my first book writing retreat was the fall of 2021 in Costa Rica. There were about six authors who all went to Costa Rica together. This was facilitated by two published authors who had prolifically published authors. And we had several days in a row. We had about a week to write. Every morning, every we all stayed together in the same resort, and not nearly as fancy as it might sound to say a resort in Costa Rica. Just a, a simple place where you can have a pillow and a comfortable bed and, and uh, in a tropical setting, really is what it is. And 
in the mornings, we would all gather for breakfast. We would talk about our goals for the day. We would talk about, we would set three goals. We would set a stretch goal, uh, sort of an intermediate goal, and then a bare minimum goal. And we would set those three goals for the day. We would, we would uh, go off and write on our own. We'd write for all morning. Lunch was on your own. After lunch was workshops. So facilitated by the workshop facilitators. The workshops were uh, on sometimes on writing topics, how to structure a paragraph, how to structure a sentence, how to write more visually, how to write more, uh, how to write more simply. And also topics on the publishing process. What does self-publishing involve? What does publishing with a publisher involve? And then we'd have more writing time in the afternoon. And then in the evenings, the best part, we gathered together, spoke about which goal we met for the day. And then also we would share what we wrote. So the ability to share what we wrote with others and then give and get feedback. As an adult, to be able to give and get feedback, that, that close feedback of your work in a, in a purely supportive environment, as an adult, that kind of opportunity is so rare. So if you are interested in writing a book, it's, I'll tell you, it's hard to get that kind of feedback from others on your writing. So a book writing retreat can be a good opportunity for you. Fantastic. In addition to your books and your articles, you also offer one-on-one -on -one coaching. Um, in a world of online courses and the Udemy's and the everything that's out there, why did you go with like, one-on-one -on -one coaching versus, you know, something that could be more broad or with a, a you know, a larger sure. audience on a given day. Yeah. Well, as far as I know, I'm the only person who's providing one-on-one, -on -one, private, individual, boutique data science training programs. Yeah. And I started with a, a coaching program, which was designed for folks who already had the data skills and really just needed to make the transition into their first formal data science role. And eventually, by request from clients and prospective clients, I also developed the boot camp program. So the private one-on-one -on -one individual boutique specifically designed for you individual boot camp program. And I think I got really lucky by discovering this model on my own because you're right. There are, there are you can you can you can find your own way. Plus, don't forget about the degree programs now that are available from a variety of universities. Plus, don't forget about the degree programs you can get from a variety of universities, graduate programs, undergraduate programs. So the private one-on-one -on -one approach lets folks start where they are. There's no prerequisite because in the private one-on-one -on -one approach, we can figure out where you are in the develop, skill development process and then start with you there. We don't have to worry about the prerequisites. So that can be a barrier for a lot of folks who are trying to go into a cohort-based program or a degree-based program. Another barrier for especially mid and late career professionals who want to go into a cohort group-based program or a degree-based program is mid and late career professionals have partners, ex-partners, kids, and sometimes aging parents all of whom demand your attention. Right. So if life happens and you're in a group cohort-based program and you need to take a break, that's a problem. You yeah. can't take a break. But in the private one-on-one -on -one boot camp individual approach, you can take a break mm -hmm. and you can go take care of your aging parent or go plan your kid's high school graduation. Whatever it is you need to do, you can have that break and then come back to the boot camp program when you're ready. Mm. Another nice thing for mid and late career professionals is that mid and late career professionals already know a lot. Yeah. So a mid and late career professional who's looking for another degree or either undergrad, graduate, or a boot camp, a group cohort based program is you have to study everything that's on the syllabus and in the curriculum. Well, in the private one on one individual approach, we can skip over the things that you already know. Right. And we can spend more time on the things that you still need to learn you haven't learned yet. The other, oh, another really great thing about the private one-on-one -on -one individual bootcamp approach is the way I do it is I just have a fee every four weeks and it's cancel any time. So if you are in the group-based program, you a lot of the times have to pay up front thousands, tens of thousands of dollars 
which may involve borrowing a lot of money. You might also have to take time off work. In the private one-on-one -on -one approach, if after the first four weeks you decide it's not a fit for you, you can you can take what you learned in those four weeks and move on to another strategy that might work mm -hmm. for you better. Right. Or you might you might work with me for four or five or six months and then decide you've learned what you need to learn, work on your own for a while, and then circle back to the private one-on-one -on -one approach. It's a perfect solution. It fills a hole in the market that mm -hmm. I think I found somewhat by accident. I guess you just have to make enough mistakes in business to eventually be successful in business. And I finally made enough. I made the mistake of offering a private one-on-one -on -one approach and then inadvertently discovered that it was a really good fit for a lot of folks. It's not a good fit for everybody, Right. But neither is the group boot camp program and neither right. is the college degree program. You have to decide and find what works for you. Fantastic. So if there are people out here listening to you describe this, have heard your conversation around data science, they're interested in making that transition. Do you have some like introductory tools where they can kind of assess what are the skill gaps that I have? Where should I go next, et cetera? The best way to do that is two things. Look for job descriptions that you would at organizations you would like to work for with the titles that you would like to have. Do that, make a pile of those, and you don't have to make a big pile, two or three of them will be fine. Then also take a look at boot camp programs or college degree programs in data science. Then make a list of everything from those job descriptions, all of the skills, the proficiencies, and the tools that are listed there, all the skills, proficiencies, and tools in the curriculum for the boot camp or the degree programs. And then once you have your combined list, highlight the ones that you, or cross off the ones that you already know, and maybe that you've already mastered, highlight the ones that you need to work on and acquire, and then build a plan from there. I have an article on this where I give this exact advice. So for the do-it-yourselfer, I always give this advice. This is the exact advice I always give. Find those job descriptions, find those curriculums or those syllabi, or program descriptions, and then plan your own plan your own learning journey on a do it yourself uh, on a do it yourself track. Fantastic! And if people are looking for more information from you, want to find more of your resources, or even maybe want to get connected with you for your book or coaching or whatever it might be, where can they find you online? Well, I'm so glad you asked. I really do like to connect with folks online, and I'm the annoying kind of person who will actually have a conversation with you. So if you reach out to me, uh, let's take LinkedIn, for example. If you're on LinkedIn, you'd like to connect with me there, and I think this advice is good for pretty much anybody on LinkedIn. Some people disagree with me on this, so take it with a grain of salt, but hit the connect button. Skip the follow button. The follow button doesn't really create an, uh, an opportunity for back and forth communication. It doesn't really create an opportunity for both people to get to know each other. And I don't know about you, but I'm on social media to get to know, to help people get to know me, but I also want to help to get to know others. So yeah. hit the connect button, add a little note to your connection request. And if you don't add a note to your connection request when you're connecting with me, you can count on it. I promise you, I will be sending you a note back saying, hey, I'm so glad we connected. I may or may not also see something in your profile that interests me and ask you about it as well. And that's a little bit different for each person depending on what is or isn't in their profile, uh, et cetera. So LinkedIn, easy to find, Adam Ross Nelson. Uh, Adam Ross Nelson on all the socials, Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, Twitter, now X. So I'm pretty easy to find and I really do hope that you will connect with me you can also go to my website, coaching.adamrossnelson.com. Fantastic. Adam, thank you so much for this fascinating conversation, letting me pick your brain about a couple topics I'm super interested in, and I hope it was helpful to our audience as well, um, learning about data science as a career, writing as a career, techniques and approaches. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for having me. I look forward to seeing the results online.